Uh, hello, uh, and welcome to the KCP Community Meeting, November 30th, 2021. Uh, we're going to skip the first topic on the agenda, uh, and maybe we'll get back to it later. There are some other people who might uh, also be joining us. But uh, David has promised us a demo with a question mark, so it's not, it's not a hard promise, but uh, uh, has invoked the word demo, and so I think we should take a minute to see if we can see a demo. Yeah, yeah, the demo should be um, available finally, <laughs> just in time. Uh, just two words first. Um, it's about the work on virtual workspaces. I started looking into uh, the feature, which is uh, based on a given user name or user ID, it gives me gives me the workspaces, uh, my my personal workspaces, or also of course return the list of the workspaces visible for a given organi organization, et cetera. So this is based mainly on uh, virtual workspaces or virtual resources, uh, which is mainly providing to the end user um, a sort of workspace, uh, a domain, you know, um, but implemented as code and usually proxying to objects that are not uh, uh, here, but that are stored on some shard, on some administrative shard of works, administrative workspace of a shard. Something. So it's mainly code that will proxy the request somewhere else. Um, and to do this, I uh, started a generic, uh, some generic code to build a virtual virtual workspace API server dedicated to a group, exactly like um, OpenShift API server is built, thanks to uh, Stefan. <laughs> Um, exactly like it is built, um, uh, who explained that to me, um, with a number of API servers delegating to, uh, um, uh, to each other and each one um, managing a given uh, group of APIs. So it's, uh, uh, the, the, the work I've done is mainly providing a framework that allows us building such virtual workspaces with m the minimum uh, size, minimum amount of code uh and then i imp implemented that i mean started testing that with the workspace workspaces to get the list of workspaces according to the current identity or group but of course it could be it would be exactly the same and could be useful for things like um virtual workspaces for api um, exports or stuff like that or even the views uh, in the future so uh, let me uh, show you or is down to in terms of demo and just stop me uh, if you have any question of course uh, so let me share this well no this window okay do you see my screen uh so, i assume yes. yes so here i have a kcp server running um and then i have a second api server i will run a second api server uh which i called of course this api server i built could also be you know added into the main kcp uh, um, process or collocated with any other process because it's an api server that can be set as a dele delegated server for another one but here I built a command line, uh, which mainly allows you starting the virtual workspaces uh, on standalone. And then I have the virtual workspaces and the workspaces subcommand, which will run um, the API server that you know um, exposes a, a get request for uh, for to to get the list of workspaces uh, for a given user, and so. Here, this will start, <coughs> sorry, an API, a dedicated API server um, uh, on, so on another port, of course. And this API server is implemented in such a way that uh, it answers not at the root, a slash, but at slash applications slash um, personal. So exactly what we aimed, um, virtual workspaces are mainly API servers with, you know, a, given arbitrary prefix, and then uh, you point to um, 
the, the and then this becomes the root of the virtual API server. So if I run that, in fact, all the auth exactly like for the OpenShift API server, which was my model, uh, the authentication and also authorization is is delegated to the main um, um, API server, which is KCP here. <clears throat> and now if in kubectl, okay, now if by default I will point to KCP, but if I do this here, um, I would be able to point to my new virtual workspaces API server that can be collocated or separated from KCP, um, from the KCP instance. Um, so of course there are a number of things to fix still, so that's why I'm in TLS verify insecure uh, true but anyway if i go at the root here i can see that i have no no um nothing in fact no resources at all of course but then if i um go at this path here services applications personal then i will see that uh, i can find my uh, objects that were registered at this um um, you know, in this AP, in this delegated API server, and I could I could have several delegated API server, one for workspaces, one for API exports, in the same um, in the same process. In fact, in the same virtual workspaces uh, command line uh, process here. And so now, if I uh, try to get a workspace. Um, of course, here um, I just uh, implemented a dummy, you know, workspace rest storage, uh, which mainly just returns a fixed workspace. But then, in this code, uh, we would easily be able to we we will be easily be able to plug um, the management of the workspace index uh, cache and then returning and of course pointing to. Uh, the shards to, to get this information and then being able to return it in any form we want. And the same also we can do here if I try to point to the object itself and, and, and get the value. So David, this is super awesome. A part of me, the part of me that loves awesome demos that like come together and then show like the big ideas would be like, will be super awesome if there was a sub resource on that workspace that gives you a cube config and we hand wave <laughs> what the actual credentials in there. But in the long run, like that would be the opportunity for you to basically, like let's say there's a sub resource that we have that lets you get mm -hmm. uh, what's effectively a bound scoped token for you from whatever, like, you know, assume the implementation yeah. is calling out to a request token interface or signing, yeah. you know, whatever. But that flow like is really important because that effectively is like it goes a kind of a it takes some of the ideas from stuff that we've done with like multi cluster and cluster mm -hmm. registry historically, but that in an in an integrated system would make the actual experience of like I've got all these cube clusters I don't really care where they run like it starts showing some of that because you can imagine this virtual workspacing being useful for things that aren't KCP right like you can see where like yeah, I'm yeah, talking sure. about cluster registry and I want to run a centralized auth story that starts to tie together like different parts of a of an experience like that also offers it because a workspace is just another perspective on a cluster like you can imagine that token coming back with a set of scopes that binds you to read access to that cluster um yeah. and could, like, I, I don't want to dive too much on it but it kind of like ties to that the point of a virtual workspace is to bring together concepts that smooth the user experience mm, yeah, yeah. over like different conceptual domains. So really awesome. Um, yes, uh, uh, the idea of, of having a, a sub resource, I mean, I had already uh, that would return a cube config or something like that, that you can just choose in, in a cube CTL plugin then to <laughs> set the new workspace and directly point to it or something like that. Uh, the next steps mainly for now would be um, probably uh, so of course trying to wire that with uh, the the uh, work on workspaces that already Steve uh, already started with the workspace uh, controller um, to be able to point to shards and get and get workspaces even if we don't have implemented the whole workspace index stuff and caching but that could at least give something 
a bit uh, that would look like future complete and 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 not not a, a fixed workspace and then also i was thinking about um workspace request a bit like uh, you have project request um in in openshift because the idea if i understand correctly was to have some sort of self-servicing on workspaces but of course a controlled one so something like workspace request that would only be available from this workspace uh, virtual workspace uh, and then from this that would according to David, the organization of the user is there any reason to to have to be read only in your implementation could we do a create like uh, yeah create? sure i mean <laughs> i you, thought it's simple but you might um, not even have to have a request like the only reason reason we did project request mm -hmm. because we were talking through the idea that there would be a different schema but like in a sense, like in a workspace request isn't terrible, like namespace and project, the idea of like, I wanna get a space to work in and create it are slightly different yeah. concepts, but like to Stefan's point, you could even post a workspace and then just apply different validation rules and say yeah, like, sure. I mean, set this or whatever, really, uh, which we, we might could, be another path. Yeah, we, we could have a create. I was thinking that, for example, um, in the future, uh, in the workspace, you might have some informations that we don't want the end user to have to bother with. So having some sort of, you know, minimal workspace request with just the name, something like that. And then the rest is derived from the organization, the, the, the user. Um, um, there's, there's a discussion, um, I think Clayton called it consistent set, or we had this inheritance in the API draft. Yeah. Um, the, I, I think everything we do in this area, like putting something into a workspace, workspace, it's instant anyway, or it should be instant. There shouldn't be objects created. So in the moment you create the object of the workspace, all those objects should be there without any persistence. So we don't need this, this template process or request process. We don't need it. Mm. Yeah, maybe. Creation, I mean, one call, that's it. Everything yeah, sure. <laughs> anyway. The, the way it's implemented is mainly that you have a, a, a generic, you know, API server and, and some helpers. And then mainly what you have to implement is just the REST storage. So then, you know, it's, you just have to create a REST, uh, a create REST, uh, I mean, implement a create REST interface. And then, you know, it's- Jason, you want to go first? Completely doable. Or did uh, anybody else Steve, have one? Was there another queue? Steve had a comment in the chat I also wanted to talk about, but I had something else after that as well. Steve? What? Hello? I, yeah, I can read Steve's question about. Oh, uh, sorry, I, di I, didn't, I didn't hear it. I think I'm a little messy this morning. I was just uh, confused about all the flags on the um, man line from when you were starting the virtual workspace API oh, server. Yeah. And I was wondering yeah. how, like, was the that URL you were hitting the personal one? Are, are you then like inspecting the auth info that you're given, and then like what's going on there? How does that flow work? Yeah, mainly um, the work, virtual workspaces API server is deli I mean, it's it's just you know copied on the OpenShift API server. Um, it's delegating. Um, authentication and authorization to uh, external um, cube API servers. So we could change that. I mean, I just did that in the beginning. Um, and, and also, but, but then that's why you have three parts in the command line, because we have the main cube config, which is uh, the one I would use, you know, to point to um, a cube config that would go to your shard, shardinator. I mean, if we can call it like that. This one, uh, I would from this one, I would get uh, all the the list of the workspaces uh, in in all shards, if I'm not mistaken. And then you have a, a, a cube config for authentication and cube config for authorization. I mean, that's just the way um, uh, OpenShift uh, API server was designed, and I mainly copied on that. And that's quite useful because useful because for now I can point those three to the same um, uh, API server, but I could point also authentication and authorization to 
kind, a small kind cluster, you know, where I define the users I, I'm interested in or something like that, just to be able to check uh, that when you change the user, uh, the behavior is different. So, I mean, yeah, I may have missed like a broader conversation about auth. Um, yeah, there's, oh, yeah. Yeah, there's something there's something missing. Um, I mean, in the background, there's subject access review taking place. <laughs> this doesn't support something like scopes of different workspaces, different virtual workspaces. So there's a lot of uh, things missing. So we have to extend this concept, this request, uh, subject access review to those. I, I was thinking even from like yeah. the, the so. logical perspective, like do we expect the delegate like if we, yeah, do we do we expect a delegate API server that can handle SARS to be the way? Like, does that even make sense in the flow of information? So here? There are two useful fundamental patterns, which is abstracting and cutting through abstractions. So, uh, the one of the ideas for virtual workspaces, I think, is about allowing us to to uh, allow tight control over what comes through but that means that that component has higher trust on whatever the delegate is right so like you can read all namespaces great there's something that can read all namespaces and then there's the argument like with push down and all that um i think that there's a separate view of the virtual workspaces that could be the hybrid of both of those where you actually are transforming an input request and pushing down like all of those things and then you get two layers of protection, which is you can double check at both layers. That has some nice security advantages, especially when we talk about like, what's the security model for a control plane that controls workloads across tens or hundreds of clusters that like we haven't spent a ton of time thinking about, but it's like every point of centralization is a point of compromise. What defense and depth would make sense? Like you might want to delegate off and security checking and do it at multiple levels. You might want to offer an uplift if you can't quite get the performance you want, um, but then you run the risk of you know accidentally exposing more data. Um, maybe there's another view, which is the delegate adding additional logic around the delegate. And that's not like what we've talked about a ton of, but imagine this virtual workspace concept in sort of front of just one cluster, right? Like the Docker registry, you can run it in a pass through mode to another registry. What would that look like? Like a lot of the stuff here might actually be super useful if you needed to do on the fly adaptation or you wanted to expose, mm -hmm. you wanted to translate APIs into earlier versions or impose additional defaulting or like, you know, make calls to things like OPA or embed CEL transformations. So maybe it's more useful to say the more use cases we have, the more it looks like a Rails for cube-like patterns, but we don't have a ton of those use cases. We have like three, four today. We're still yeah. kind of in the, maybe it's not super generic. Yeah, for now it's it's really mainly um, each, API, each API server, um, you know, rooted at a given prefix path um, is related to a group. So, uh, because it's, you know, I just implemented it very simply. So typically for virtual workspaces where we could um, return any type, you know, of that would just be some sort of proxies on other API server that could return any type the proxy the API server proposes. It's not something that I implemented for now, but that could be done quite the same way. Um, and or another point for now also, also is that uh, open API is not supported. But I mean, as a first, uh, as a first step, it you know only breaks the um, explain kubectl command. But it it, it would be. It's an awesome demo, David. It's interesting because like that's a little bit more the minimal API server than I think what we've done on the other stuff for minimal API servers before. <laughs> so it like shows a different angle of minimal API server that I don't think we kind of planned on originally. But it has a lot of um, it has a lot of the same ideas and and value if we can figure out like what use cases to line it up to um, and yeah, how to make it useful. There are no CRDs, but then uh, it, it's quite different. It's sort of proxy. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, you had your hand up and then put it down. I wanted to make sure either your question was answered or you decided not to ask it or. I, I think it's answered. Clayton okay. explained about two levels of authentication we do this topic. 
yeah cool. yeah and mainly the, the the way it is now is is just to play to be able to play with it i mean play with it and adapt and yeah yeah cool um thank you for showing that that was really cool um i want to move on because uh vince is here and we wanted to talk about hello <laughs> uh and we wanted to talk about the uh oh, i'm not presenting anymore i can fix that um about potentially reusing the conditions library uh, from the cluster API. Uh, Steve, you, oh God, everything's going crazy. Uh, Steve, you opened this, and I think Andy also had uh, comments and thoughts. I will take it away to either one of you, give it away to either one of you. Sure, uh, I can hop in, because I know Steve's feeling a bit under the weather. So, um... For those who don't know, I spent a lot of time working on a cluster API in the past, and Vince uh, is, is still working on cluster API. And um, some of the folks over there wrote this really awesome uh, library for working with conditions. And unfortunately, it's specifically typed to the cluster API conditions struts in a very specific Go package. And so there is a question or some thinking around, could we do some code generation in the short term to have a conditions library like what's in CAPI that can work with any sort of condition types and maybe in the future use generics when Go 118 is out and available. So um, that's the seed of the conversation. and. Uh, Vince, I don't know if you had any thoughts already or any comments on what I just mentioned. Um, I think like, so I mean, there's like the, the, the two components that we have is like um, the condition struct, like the, the interface that you have to satisfy is in our API group right now. So that might have to move out. Then there is the package under util, which could also move out into its own maybe repo and code module. So separate from where it's today. But then the other piece that's missing is the um, the patch helper. Because uh, like we do use control runtime client in the patch helper, like it takes care of conditions and possible conflicts. Um, so like that like needs to be a, like a little bit more thought out. Um, the first thing that I actually thought like when, when I saw the issue was to potentially upstream this. I don't know if it, I don't, I don't think like you folks use your control runtime. Maybe we can just create a Kubernetes repo under SIGS, uh, Kubernetes SIGS repo. So Vince, that's actually, so two questions. One, have you looked at, uh, with this, have you looked at server-side apply yet and how the library would be impacted by that? Or do you think it's covered under the existing patch or merge stuff? Uh, the patch the patch is done. Um, it's a custom made because server side apply at the time. I don't think right now control runtime does very good support for it. it I don't know if anything to... supports it really well yet. Yeah, that's kind of why I was asking. I didn't know if you y'all were ahead of the curve. No, we have we haven't actually used used that because last time I looked, like control runtime was just saying like I own all the fields every time you issue a patch. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's kind of like what everybody does, but that kind of defeats the purpose, right? <laughs> um, and the other challenge was that like the field conditions is like a slice. So you can't say I own a, condi a specific condition. Um, you can't say it because the type should be the same as like a name discrimination. There should only be one condition of each type. In that, a that, yeah, that's correct. Um, but when I looked at it, like the owner of the, it's the owner of the slice, mm -hmm. right? It's like not each condition. So you, um, you can't do it per merge key. It's interesting because I swear we had this problem in another spot because we would have this on pods in containers. It's a whole bunch of them, yeah. So it's kind of interesting because maybe like that's something that did get, or or maybe as a giant gaping truck hole in server side apply that everybody just hand waved across. It'd be good to know for sure. Um, a second, like you know, it's interesting because could you do like for all the places where you have real types, is there is there a way to model it as an interface? Mm -hmm. It's already actually modeled as an interface. Then when you define your own conditions, um, your types <clears throat> have to satisfy the interface. 
Okay, because we very early in Cube, we were like, ah, we'll use physical types and just generate everything. And then we found more, like a lot of the ugly hacky reflection code that was there in the very early days, kind of like mm -hmm. over time, we like kind of tried to get it out and replace it with more things like, you know, the object meta interfaces. And we never really pushed all the way through there because it was always a manual thing in the core code. But as we've gotten into CRDs, like I would like to see better interface use in the core code base. So even like in a client go kind of thing, if we could, you know, I think it's fine to think about it as a library, but like, there's part of me that's like, this is, conditions are pretty fundamental to cube. I'd like to make the case that we need to take conditions more seriously. Like certainly there was like the whole, uh, we, were, we, you know, a couple of years ago, we we're like, well, maybe we won't go like, partially due to cluster API and K native feedback. We we're like, maybe we won't be generic. We'll just go use concrete fields. And then we, we tack back and we like, they're extensible. They allow multiple controllers to coordinate. I do at least feel like we have a little bit of momentum in that space. So I would like to see something closer to core. I guess another question would then be, um, does Jason, the point you brought up about Knative, like are there any similarities between what Knative was doing with the duct typing that could benefit, like to you know get allies in the condition fight and join together? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, these are the only two, as far as I know, these are the only two like reusable, intended to be reused packages for conditions. If there are others, please let us know. Because uh, I think it definitely makes sense to upstream, like what's the word for when you upstream and merge something at the same time? Uh, uh, this and Knatives both into the same place. I don't think either of them are, like I don't think that, I don't know, neither of them are massively better than the other one, as far as I can tell. I've only ever really used Knatives. I've never used uh, cluster APIs. But they seem roughly the same. Uh, so Knatives works by embedding the, their status type. I could find yeah. it somewhere. Uh, uh, you embed Knative status type, which provides conditions. And then you already get all of the interface satisfaction stuff because you embed that type. Uh, that's just a different way to go rather than have. Is this, uh, Vince, you mentioned that there is an interface that uh, customers have or clients have to use of this to be able to benefit. Is this the interface that uh, you have to implement the get conditions, cluster B1 conditions interface? Yeah, so so this is the the util library, right? Like so yeah, the one, yeah, yeah. Um, to use this util library, you have to have get conditions and set conditions on it. The mm -hmm. client object is the um, close, the control runtime client object, which um, if I remember correctly, it's just a runtime object and meta object at the same time. Because okay. you use them all the time together, but we just said we're just going to merge these two into an object in control runtime. Yeah. Um, Sean, you have raised your hand. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, can folks hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I think that there's also a conditions library inside OpenShift's operator SDK. Um, you might want to bring those folks in as well. I think that they were doing something similar to like the embedding or any, or something like that. Um, and making that work. So just something to also uh, add to that list of people who have attempted condition libraries. Yeah, that's that's super useful. I will also look for that and add it to somewhere. I'm not sure who on the Knative side we, we should uh, forcibly volunteer into working on this, but we can I can find somebody. The um, there's, there's a separate thread that this made me think of. Um, we had a brief discussion, like unstructured, um, originally, we almost got close to doing a better unstructured interface library. Like it's kind of mucky. A lot of the physical types, like the go, the cube go types, just kind of like evolved. We never actually went back and looked at like um, ergonomics on it, deep copy and conversion. And all of these are kind of, what is the next practical thing we need to get to that next step and survive? But interfaces, um, better ergonomics for unstructured uh, that feel more natural. And then the stuff that service, uh, this is partially why I brought up server side apply. Um, there is generated server side apply helper code that tackles some of the, you know, go and set individual fields, right? It's kind of the, um, what's it called? Fluent style for that. And it works better with patching and all of that because you can define your function, take your base object and say, set, 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 set in a way that, you know, 
at least gets at some of those natural semantics. It's not perfect by any means, um, but it feels like the intersection of those is a little bit of like the general problem space here is we've let CRDs and Go types kind of disperse into the wild, but we have a bunch of common patterns. We're not as disciplined about the core patterns that we use. We kind of let them, ex like we let different groups building in the ecosystem or different SIGs or different projects try them. Um, but doing something to like bring them back in, I feel like for you know easy, like we're going to be dealing in, the, at least even in KCP land with thousands, like everything is going to be an unstructured object. Lots of things, like part of the benefit of just dealing with CRDs and all that is like, if you can get it down to like where the apply loop is core, you're using server side apply, you're using conditions. And then we start thinking about stuff like, oh, I wanna add facets to objects dynamically right, adding new fields or stripping fields or, you know, being able to take object A and combine it with a duct type B and get an object C that you expose in a workspace and you never know that there's a different version of it, like that's part of the infrastructure. A lot of that models some of those same things of, uh, if we can get to some of that together, like and find use cases, like we'll want those pieces in place. So I, I think like the, I don't know if everybody needs to change and that's maybe the one obstacle here is like we got to climb the hill um but it would be good maybe to I, like i really agree jason like trying to canvas and with a couple of groups and being like hey does this make sense to have in core can we get some base agreement on a couple concepts nothing here yeah. is even really objectionable from stuff we've said before um a lot of times is who's going to support it and you know is who's willing to uh you know do the sig arch sig api machinery sig cli sig 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 dance um yeah, I mean the the nice thing about duct typing is that it doesn't your Go type doesn't have to conform to this interface for it to be you know detectable and pick upable as a as a thing with conditions that you operate on. Um, the downside is that it duct typing works by like JSON marshaling and checking for the existence of fields, which can be slow and annoying and gross. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll I know for a while there were folks in. K native land looking to upstream duct typing aspects and and I think conditions was a big part of that so I'll but I haven't heard anything from them since so I, I will go ping some folks and see see what happened uh, Vince you have your hand up yeah I was gonna add to what Clayton was saying it's like the the challenges that we have with the intersectional and structured and CRDs is that like you don't know if it's if it's a if a type is of which type. So it's like if you have a status dot condition in there, you don't know if it's like the core conditions or it's your own conditions. As you as you mentioned, it's like it's just JSON, it's like you just unmarshal it. If there was a concept of like core unmarshal, and then maybe like we could start with that X cut I'm jumping ahead, but like if you have like an X uh, kind of slash annotations like says these are the core conditions and they do respect these types. Then on Marshall, maybe like it could be a little bit more smarter to get that information back so that you know what it's trying to do. Um, because we ended up rewriting probably all the projects like it did the same thing. Um, ended up rewriting like a lot of like the uh, conflict resolution logic for conditions. Because when you want to merge these things, these conditions together, you don't want to lose information unless there is a conflict. But conflict has different definitions. It's when you pat or like when you update. And there is a conflict on the, or like I guess when you patch with the preserves version and there is a conflict in the reserves version, you want to do uh, like a two-way merge uh, of those conditions and then reapply it to see you know if everything went smoothly. But then our problem was that like different controllers could write like kind of the same condition sometimes, and so how, there like you just have to return an error. So that was a, the specific bit that we do have in our code which would be great if we can work with others uh, to just like counter a solution like what is what should be a condition in Kubernetes and how we define it. And yeah, Evan was the person I was thinking of as well. I don't know how much time he spent on, but like, um, so to Dems's question, you're absolutely right, Dems. Um, maybe like then the, like Vince following up on that too, like a lot of this is, can we come up with a reason that gives us a strong case for improving this across a bunch of places at once. So like some of like the KCP mindset is like, if we're abstracting all these types, we wanna make sure that the machinery in cube is really good for CRDs. It gives us a reason to improve CRDs. It gives us a reason to invest. 
Um, if a user gets some benefit out of using this library, like a controller author, because it makes some use case better. So like, um, like at least for like in the KCP use cases, which I'm just like going through my head here, it's the, are you scheduled? Are you unscheduled? We want, we would really want to be like, yeah, every UI could just go look at the scheduled condition. Oh, your type doesn't have a conditions field. What would it take to get you to have those? That also leads some other questions like, you know, maybe CRDs should start, like maybe we should start thinking about like, what are the things that everybody should have that they don't have on CRDs that could be options for CRDs or what's something that's better than just spec status split? Um, you know, we've come up with a couple of other things like, um, you know, uh, phase is definitely something a lot of people have. I doubt there'll be one common thing, but conditions is like, if there's something that everybody has, it's conditions. Scale is another one um that kind of made sense it had a very concrete reason and so people were incentivized to go use scale we just got to figure out what those incentives are to like will benefit because this library is there because this user will benefit yeah i think that, uh you mentioned also that uh how do we handle things that don't have conditions or don't have status i think most things do but if we have the uh library in place to 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 do duct type condition grabbing, uh, then it can also be responsible for fallback. Like I think we've talked about a long time ago, writing this stuff to annotations if we can't put it anywhere else. Uh, it could be responsible for writing it to an annotation and you know detecting that and pulling it back out and saying, well, your condition is actually this. You don't have the you don't have a status or you don't have a status conditions, but using this library, we can make it look like you do, uh, which would be a useful thing. Even for us. internal. Even internal types in cube, like nobody, like we don't really love internal types. They're really a performance thing that we never went back and addressed. But one of the things is like unstructured is too unstructured. Go types are really fast and there's nothing in the middle. So a lot of the machinery, like we use the JSON, we use the JSON patch library to do like things that don't have anything to do with patching because the the merge algorithm is something that we spec as part of a behavior uh, but a lot of like uh jordan and i were like we keep we keep going back to serialization libraries because like more stuff uses json crds are still slow we've got to do something about protobuf like gogo -Go protobuf at some point so we've kind of been like can we get to a faster json implementation that everybody could use go cc is actually one of the few that kind of like it's basically building a shape. It builds a, it builds a little virtual machine for parsing a type, um, and it does it in a fairly principled way. Um, and so it, it gets you know a little bit faster than even the best libraries. It's more principled than JSON iter, but like that model in memory of like here's the fields, here's the slots. Reflection in Go doesn't quite do it. Types are types are very useful, but they're not good for change unstructured really is a bit of a mess it may be that what we're looking for and we've always talked about this with like um i don't i don't think anybody here was even working on cube when we talked about this the last time but uh smart objects maybe andy remembers or stefan maybe this is something we talked about like we were talking about runtime object in cube in the absence of generics in the absence we were like you know there's some value in saying that instead of it just being passing around a go type we'd pass something that's a little bit more of a wrapper around the underlying object, right? Um, handling serialization and letting you benefit if that object's already been serialized without change. Um, and so we talked about some of those things. I don't know that we really need that for what we're doing, but it does kind of align to uh, what's the programming model for a cube object that would fix a lot of the painful stuff once you get past like, I'm just gonna put this object, once you get into patch, once you get into server side apply, once you get into conditions control merging, there is a lot of duplicated code. It may be that we have enough of a use case now to say, like, maybe we can align that with, you know, a better unstructured, a faster JSON serializer, and some of the, like, lazy or unlazy typing where you'd want to be able to say, like, hey, I'm passing this unstructured around. Like, what type is this even? Um, if I make some change, if I apply a patch to it, is it still valid? Um, I don't know how many use cases we'll have of that, but the CEL stuff might definitely trigger it because CEL itself is kind of uh, data that comes from a a schema. So, so the the real concrete use case we have, well, one of them is that we need to mark any object of any resource as unschedulable, for instance, or 
moving across shards or you know whatever it is. We need we need some way to say you're weird uh, without knowing what that thing is. Um, okay, so and we would also like to make it easier for CRD authors to make this easy for us by having there be a good conditions library and adopting conditions as a best practice everywhere. I mean, I think it's I think it's already a best practice, but everybody defines their own conditions type everywhere, which is annoying. Uh, okay, I'm going to take an action item to talk to Evan and um, the whoever on the operator SDK team is working on that condition stuff. And probably then I will rope you into something later uh, and we'll see if we can make any progress on coming to a, a, a good central place for all of this. I mean, everybody has a, a library for this, but everybody hates it. So we should all just have one that we centrally focus on hating. That's what's called efficiency. Um, OK, uh, great. Um, I'm going to uh, let me present uh, some more. Are people seeing is that working? OK. Um, yeah, I wanted to give an update on some of the uh, last week I went over the namespace scheduler. I've made some progress on there. I still think there's a couple more things I want to do, but uh, thank you for the feedback from Steve and uh, Andy and everyone else who has commented. Uh, we're using separate queues for different resources, which is excellent. We're in, in queuing resources instead of doing it synchronously. That was very nice. Unit tests exist and even pass, which is amazing. Uh, and I just need to write end-to-end -end tests and clean up some dependency injection. Otherwise, it seems. Uh, like it's in a pretty good state. Um, also, uh, I think we talked about last week. I don't remember if we talked about last week. It's been a whole week ago that uh, we were uh, adding the OICD, OIC, OIDC flags to uh, KCP so that we can um, support OIDC authentication. That's in, or sorry, that is proposed but needs a rebase on some of Steve's uh, uh, improvements. Uh, David, yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, that's going to be very interesting um, paired with the uh, virtual workspace stuff because then in OIDC you might also be able to get or to grab some <clears throat> attributes of the user, which could be interesting as, as a very first step, you know, to implement some sort of the user belongs to a given organization so and stuff like that. Yeah, that that I think that is a that is an area where we need to like the we need to be looking at what is the intersection of oft authenticated attributes and workspaces tied to use case not yeah. everybody's going to have like the same organization structure but if we can get a close enough one then you know doing some of that stuff that can encourage like coordination across larger sets of cube you know user bases and you know large enterprises etc yeah, do we do we want to open the can of worms of being able to answer queries like show me all workspaces for which I have right or you know admin access to something more than just like I have an attribute that I am in a group but like I have this role yeah that's or things I have this role in or whatever it was assumed that we would go into that at some point yeah. um, but I think there's some modeling questions um, which is uh, the context that you do that in you probably like. This is like the lesson I think namespaces and projects in OpenShift have really, like if you want to cube control apply, Helm apply, GitOps apply, you're looking for predictable naming. With RBAC, what are the odds that you can apply and get a predictable set of names that aren't colliding with someone else? The collision aspect is one of the most problematic from a, like, I want, I want a list of everything I have access to. That's kind of the use case of like people have granted me access to a bunch of really independent, discrete things that don't really share any overlap. The different use case is I'm deploying, you know, I want to get Opsify multiple teams deploying, you know, a full like microservice, or I want to break that up or split it together. That use case is subtly different from the workspaces I have access to. It might be more like I want to create a place, like an organization or a container for all my workspaces and then i want to be able to do cube control apply and get the same names there so that i have reproducibility um, 
we probably just need to tee that up as a what are the requirements for dealing with groups beyond the basic i've got access because cube didn't like i don't think anyone's ever really tried to do a how do i cube control apply an entire company's stuff in one spot that may not be an actual use case right it might be and how would an organization deploy like a uh, i don't know how many people here are familiar with like airship and the work that was done around OpenStack and Telco around Helm and all of that. But I think it was called Airship. That was a big initiative, which was like, could you deploy an entire Telco infrastructure, like from like RAN to Central Core to apps to like huge swaths of, you know, infrastructure from a single spot? That may not be a use case, but like part of that big idea with control plane would be like, if you could get it big enough and we leave those affordances in place, what would people need to be able to, like an organization admin to be like, yeah, I'm going to deploy, you know, a cloud-like infrastructure in one place, like stuff that kind of goes like like Terraform, right? How would you deal with, a, you know, hundreds of teams with different Terraform files and different permissions and different groups? Today, the answer is YOLO it, microservices, everybody go and have fun, call me when we get a security breach and turns out we're missing the processes. There's a maybe a, that angle is like, hundreds of groups working together maybe that's not the list of access control but it's like uh we create a bucket and they can all go keep control apply and that's a very good use case for uh um virtual workspaces like with create yeah. and the list like i'm in an org i've created it how would i get into that org i might need a different like maybe that's not the same thing as like that those show up in my list of workspaces but i don't go there to keep control apply that that's a wrinkle that we can work through yeah, I think the the reason I uh, wanted to push on more more finer grained uh, access control stuff, and it's probably a huge diversion, uh, is there's this problem in Google Drive where if I want to share a doc with Clayton and he doesn't have access, and I just go, ah, screw it, I'll share it with everyone at Red Hat, right? And now Steve, when he opens Google Drive, sees my random doc. It's not sensitive. It's not like he can't see it, but like it just doesn't it doesn't need to be in his face when he opens the page, you know. Uh, so if you say like, show me all workspaces for which I have any amount of access whatsoever, you're going to get. And maybe just, it's a sensitivity issue, but it's also just like a spam issue. Like I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm technically have access to ten thousand workspaces I don't I don't care about. Well, I can spear fish you. I can create yeah, one and share yeah. it with a name that's one character off. So like we we need to be sensitive to that. And I think that's a reasonably good reason of we might want a a way for you to see the list of all the things you have, but maybe that's more of a it's a it's kind of carved off into a specific place where maybe the way that you access it is like, what are the ones I want to work with? What are the ones in this context? Yeah. And we we come up with ways of addressing that. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe uh, maybe just one point here uh, in the demo uh, I did. The the idea is that you know you have a prefix slash services slash applications slash personal, but in fact uh, it's a threefold prefix um, as as was designed initially by Clayton and Jessica. I think it's you have either personal, organization, or global, and in fact. Um, it's just the same API server, but that will grab the last part of the prefix and then have a, a, a different strategy in the context so that when you get in the rest uh, storage to, to get the list of the workspaces uh, or also to create, uh, the rules would be different and the way you would, and, and obviously the, the authorization um, you know, rules would be different according to the scope of the workspace list you want. So that, that's how at least I am uh, envisioned that initially in this virtual mode space. Does it make sense according to the current discussion? Yeah, it, and some of like the some of what we're kind of like gonna dance around is like, what are we actually? What what is the core use case we're trying to enable? Large organizations, lots of teams, someone being able to deploy like not just a whole service mesh like today. You could do GitOps and deploy service mesh across lots of clusters. You can do all of this stuff. You can break each of your teams down. You can give them policy. You can do what would like thinking through the mindset of I can easily be like bulk apply everything, or I can look at it and say you can bulk apply, but then I have a parallel set that's like oh this is this is prohibited, right? So 
work mm -hmm. virtual workspaces are a tool for that as well. So I think that the starting point is where you are as we go forward. Um, maybe some organizations actually do want to get in there with code or with, um, and we probably want to come up with some examples, but um, like a, you want to ensure that the rules of how you create places to do work are fungible and flexible. Uh, maybe that's in code uh, for a, a certain type of user who wants to create these like and, and run them in their org. But the more the larger case would be the yeah, I just want to put some controls on and be able to impose them from one side. What would the virtual workspace infrastructure need to look like? Um, you know, there's lots of ways that we can approach it. So yeah, sure. Uh, cool. So with the last few minutes, I wanted to go through and do um, uh, go through remaining items on prototype two and do a sort of status uh, check. This is well build and run kcp we can do that right that's done <laughs> i think we can say that yeah <laughs> uh, I, was, I was wondering i mean it says they, they can fork the repo is this a useful api server library what is the output here no so i, I had like asked this compiles? as well and it, it's literally just can you clone the repo and build kcp and run it no changes can you, as someone who is interested in KCP and the idea of KCP, get something working on your local laptop easily as we're doing something for our developer users um, who are approaching this, who are not us? OK. Yeah, and that's, that's more of a demo of minimal API server where you can run this in one terminal and in another hoop that'll get you know, whatever and see that it works. Um, great, easy, done. Uh, register a physical cluster with KCP. This is uh, has no changes since the last time we prototyped anything. So cl a physical cluster registration is very, very, very bad. Um, you just give it a kube config and it connects and installs a syncer and works, hopefully. Um, we need to design a better way to do this, but I haven't really made any progress on this. Uh, recently well um, do we i mean as written we fulfill the objectives uh, so if we need if we need to design yeah. something better i feel like we should probably we definitely that. don't do this we have a design for how to do this but we don't do this oh sure that. yeah um and is this done Like we don't take we don't take into account workspace preferences when we schedule stuff to physical clusters. Um, so that's I mean I think I think there are things we need to do, but that's about it. Uh, the sinker can run as an understand that comment that you just had highlighted. A shard uh, can be configured with a location in workspaces. Yeah. Now that I'm reading it, I agree with you. Um, I thought this, well, when I read it and understood it before reading it and not understanding it, uh, it sounded like a workspace can describe the set of physical clusters or traits of physical clusters or something about physical clusters it cares about scheduling stuff too. And that is taken into account when resources in those workspaces are scheduled, which is not is not currently the case and is probably more on me than on you. Uh, and it has nothing to do with shards. Yeah. A shard or, instance, or a single instance of a server, but it could be the the code that does the scheduling, or it could be a, but, but is it on the server? Like if you're shard, describing yeah. well, you're describing which physical clusters the order workspace would like to land on by virtue of maybe like what I I think that's an, I think it's an even simpler use case, which is um, any workload in any workspace, all workloads, maybe we could say all, all workloads on an instance of KCP can get scheduled to one of a set of clusters as the bare minimum so that you can have something that schedules you into clusters. Like just one, not, that, not not end user configurable, not okay. that would be a minimum bar, I think. In that case, I think this whole section doesn't belong in re register a physical cluster. It belongs in transparent multi cluster below. Yes, because this is a this is an, it, your description of it is nothing about 
uh, yep. registering a physical cluster with a workspace or set of workspaces or vice versa. The administrator can set it up so that a set of static physical clusters is used, maybe another way of saying that. And the only thing that's needed is like, you can show the basic demo goal of like, I have a workload on a cluster and I do something in the workload, you know, is no longer in that cluster. It yes. gets scheduled. Yeah. Like the bare minimum of that idea is what was intended. Like the administrative gotcha. configuration of physical clusters such that scheduling does something useful. Yeah. Is that, so, go ahead, Steve. But is, is this pointing a workspace at a location? I'd say it's even, it's the, not pointing a workspace, but pointing every workspace to the same location via some config option, like somewhere on, anywhere on the physical surface area of the configuration of the KCP instance scheduler being like, here's the clusters when, to go to. These when are my workspace moves between shards, does it get undone? This is this assumes that we don't have move between shards yet. It's just like, what is, is this the, a stepping stone to something? Yeah, this should be the stepping stone to the next step would be, I can, we can come up with the first draft of what location looks like uh, as maybe a administrator. Okay, so this is like a location precursor. Correct. Location precursor is a great way to describe it. So for the one that's highlighted, is that coming out of prototype two? It needs to be there for TMC. Like TMC has to be able to put something somewhere. This was, you can say what the somewhere is. So like we have the cluster type right now, and that represents basically a, a cube config to a cluster, to a P cluster. What more do we need to do for prototype two around this um, registering a physical cluster? So uh, the, the rough is, do we absolutely have to let an end user create a workspace and, and provide a new cluster for prototype two? Probably not, but I think it would be, I would turn that question back around, which is thinking about, I'm coming to prototype two, I'm expecting to see this. Do, do I as an admin or something need a physical knob I can turn to show that? Or do we think that the demo holds together, the, the prototype holds together and shows the concepts enough? So this is a qualitative value judgment for Jason and maybe Steve and Andy and others who have strong opinions on does it show off the idea of placement? And then the next step is down the road, we have to show movement. We did not really emphasize movement here. In yeah, because this, this point is about registering physical clusters, not schedule, not even scheduling stuff to it. I think, I think uh, we can probably, I think we can demo a useful, interesting, novel thing without there being a separate concept between a physical cluster and a location for now, for this prototype. I think right. that's something we'll want in the future, but I don't think we need to do that now. I, I, to get rid of both of these? Probably, yeah. Can you Let's scroll back up to the demo section? Like, do we need to adjust things in here that relate to locations? Yeah. I mean, this seems suspect. And again, we know that to demo, like, and maybe the flip side of what you said, Jason, is right now we don't need to just show, to show the idea that like I can replace a non-functioning work cluster with a functioning cluster in a disaster scenario. I'm going to come in and create a location and then say, add that location to something such that things react to it and start moving workloads. Um, that is a secondary step after I have two clusters pre-configured and I destroy one of them and you see them move or tree move, which is a step after I can just see stuff placed. And I think I guess I think it's okay to kill seven. What about right. ten? Because I think ten also presupposes that we have two locations, which I think is a misunderstanding of maybe the indirection there. Like I would have expected we... two P clusters in one location with failover between them. Yeah, I mean, it, it could ten just be I've got two two physical clusters. Well, and... two, two explicitly calls that out. Starts KCP and two kind clusters. Three. No, no, yeah, two I'm two saying clusters. ten has two locations. Yeah, I, I think for for prototype two, we could just replace anything that says location with 
physical clusters. And physical do we cluster, physical cluster is and actually let's let's be clear though physical cluster is not we know that like we're gonna change it so what yeah. we're saying is under the covers there's physical clusters location is the projection into the workspace yeah. it's okay for prototype two to can the projection into the workspace unless like because we already knew that we we didn't know exactly how to represent it exactly how to model it um, I think it's a key part of the story do we need it Jason to do TMC for prototype two I think we do not and I think removing that layer of abstraction and indirection will save us valuable time and then while we design yeah. that for, in the future because for number if 10 they... do we disrupt the service or do we just administratively move what, what think... is what is something that's going to feel like sorry probably this would be my guidance find something that feels like of the same equivalent heft as the first time you saw cube someone delete a pod and saw it move and then say like use that as the filter which is this is half as exciting as that because we don't have all the move stuff okay but when we add the move stuff it'll be equally exciting okay so maybe let's remove p cluster one right like disrupt service to me almost reads like i'm somehow monitoring and i have some like metrics based understanding of a disruption which i, I don't think disrupts p cluster one and app moves to p cluster two i think the way that we can indicate show this is yeah. to I think we can do this by either like kind delete cluster one or yes, yeah. set yeah. it as unready somehow using kubectl, kubectl edit or something, you know, do something else. Yeah, I mean, yeah my feeling as well is, is that if we remove the location abstraction for now, then we nearly have uh, uh, what is required. I mean, currently the cluster controller already reacts to cluster creation or uh, removal. And even the initial deployment splitter was doing uh, the required stuff if you removed a, a, a cluster. So, uh, in the demo I did some, some weeks ago on the workspace, that was a bit the same. Mm -hmm. You remove on one side and then uh, everything is, is, is moved to the, other, to, the, yeah. to, the, to the other place. So, I mean, it seems to me that we would just have to slightly enhance some sort of scheduler that would annotate uh, the you know cluster annotation accordingly, but apart from that, uh, we have all the rest. It seems to me. Yeah, I think. I think we... Is nuking the kind cluster emotionally equivalent to someone trying the prototype to deleting a pod or shutting down a cube node? Like, think about any any demo that you saw that really showed up that promise of cube, and then just map it as the as the heuristic. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that seems like a compelling you know toy demo to me to to here are my two clusters delete one it moves over here bring it back up delete the What's other one the, um, you can you can juggle them back and forth as many times as you want while we're up here what is the value add of having capacity in some sense with scheduling i think that might also be a uh location specific concept uh yeah capacity to physical cluster we may I, I would probably say we're a little early for capacity and it's okay to to, to prune it we down. mentioned capacity as well on five yeah. yeah uh workspace within the org with low capacity that is picking a shard and so that's a different kind of capacity so Wait, that what? is so but it, this is picking a shard we only have one shard so we pick the shard we don't need to pick it with capacity so i think that's right but there are two different they were the original reason those two were called out and this was in the more the these were grabbed from the whole demo not prototype two like the the the, the what would you do for an mvp kind of thing so carving those out is sure shards and clusters should be able to share enough of the infrastructure we're not doing shards yet and we're not doing placement on capacity yet so it's okay gotcha okay uh i'll go through and clean this up a bit but i think we what we did was remove the concept of locations as an abstraction and in, in an indirection things will just physical clusters will uh register stuff will get scheduled and moved there you can delete one and it'll move elsewhere that's enough makes sense uh uh yeah sinker will run with minimal permissions when i do that work um 
workspace administration and tenancy. How do we feel about this one? Is anybody? So I, I think there's there are two aspects to this. There's the um, well, maybe more than two. So I'm working on trying to do simple API inheritance from one workspace to another with CRDs. Uh, I think I'm on my third or fourth iteration of trying to figure out how to plumb this through, but I think I maybe have an idea that uh, could pass muster for upstream. So I'm working on that right now. Um, the uh, I think there's still RBAC, which hasn't been defined, and then yeah. uh, the things that Steve is working on around um, this workspace scheduling and assignment. Yeah, for, for me, just looking like the second bullet point is like a complete question mark. I'm not sure we've honestly even had a conversation about the modeling for permissions. The third bullet point talks about size and capacity planning again. Um, I'm going to nuke that. Uh, is the point about a workspace being typed as organizational and containing other workspaces that's still on the table? Um, I think we should figure out what the like to what end. Um, we can certainly have a logical cluster that contains workspaces. That's what and I've. I've been just hacking for right now and saying all workspaces live in the admin logical cluster. Uh, we can change that later, but it works for now. Right. I see a and, thumbs and, up from Clayton. And I, I, I guess I just wondered, like, what's the, like, what is the demo? Like, what are we doing with organizational type of workspace? Like, what is that? I guess we kind of, do we need something more than an informal understanding of, like, this is where, API inheritance comes from and other workspaces exist? I, I would say for prototype two, no. I think like something beyond prototype two that involves org workspaces and more, um, more than just basic scheduling will pull in all of the thinking that Stefan and David and others have been looking at around the workspace index and, and real sharding and the architecture there. But I don't think if you go back up to the demo and you don't have to scroll, Jason, but like looking back at what's up in there, I don't think that there's anything that we specifically need around org workspaces. Like we can just, just say just a good yeah. A good naming basically, right? Yeah. So we can just yeah, say like, like it's called there, there is an in, implicit org workspace and it happens to be admin but the user doesn't know about that yeah but that maybe that's related to virtual workspaces i mean it seems to me uh that when you connect you just get you you just get into a virtual workspace and then uh, either uh, you can create a workspace that will finally be a real workspace in the in the logical you know organizational logical cluster but but i mean from the it seems to me that that virtual workspaces um i mean whose whose skeleton i showed just today uh, is related to this because yeah i mean i think that's a, that's a level of interaction that hides this from like an end user um yeah. i just yeah I, I was just trying to understand like when we talk about order workspace in the context of this prototype like what are we trying to show off i would say the i i think like based on what we're saying like the org wakes workspace is like the idea that there's something above workspace that provides meaningful defaults and controls for the org for the the person like an organization organ, uh, workspace is for an individual or a team. The organizational workspace is the meta idea and not does not have to be concrete that shows uh, an admin doing some things to enable some things that end up with end users successful and I based andy i think i agree like the the root workspace and inheritance shows that what would we need to do in the demo to capture that in the demo flow of saying the admin is logging in and they're in the you know they're setting up some rules for the rest of these workspaces to follow like we can say there's just one org organs or workspace per uh, instance today and that's the the root workspace 
So the, the and, interesting and useful and emotionally connecting part of this demo that we're talking about is an, an org admin logs in somewhere and says, you all get these APIs. And now somebody logs into a child workspace and says, oh, I have these APIs. And then the admin yeah. edits the APIs and the child says, oh, now I have these new APIs. Thank you right. for and then APIs. the user can like, and, and then when we get into API export, the user will then will just add onto the end of that, and then the user overrides those APIs or adds their own gotcha. API or consumes sure. an API, and so, then we'll have more workspaces, and we'll say, ah, but what if you have two team, two groups of teams? Um, so, I think that's right, Jason. I'm going to make a note for me or someone else to expand this point to be all of those points of showing Add an notes. API inheritance and API virtualization. And for the authorization part, is this enough what David basically showed that workspaces are filtered and only the admin sees the admin workspace? Or do we want more? We, we could there was an back thing. Yeah, we could put, put it up something where we at a scope, like something I, I feel like, which makes holes yeah, I, um, restrictable two workspaces. I'd, I'd want to see uh, when Jason's done typing what that yeah. actually says, because I don't know that I, I mean, maybe I wasn't around, but I don't have we had any conversation about access control and like data flow and like, <laughs> so uh, there is going to be a working group that takes full experts from here and mixes them with experts. Jessica has been chasing a lot of that um, with CIAM and with App Studio. So at a very high level use case, yes. Implementation, no. Understanding of what that actually means, no. And that will try to get that going soon, Steve. So when is this demo? And what are we showing vis-a-vis -vis access control before we have that group together to answer this one some is, of these questions? I would say this one, though, like the minimal RBAC, though, that's making workspaces zero cost. That was what it primarily was. There's your cost right now. So, right. so RBAC is RBAC is not what what it sounds like saying Clayton is that um, RBAC is here as an example of a thing that an admin can define in the admin workspace that child workspaces get for free without you know zero cost. Not specifically that it is RBAC rules specifically being defined. Example, I would say uh, because we have to make workspaces zero cost and the default cube model is to go copy and create all this stuff and we're trying to really hit on the zero cost aspect, what we're saying is in order to even just make RBAC basically work, we need to do the bare minimum so that you could we'll say, okay, an admin comes in and then gives access to this team. What does that even look like? Does we have to have that for prototype two? Negotiable. An admin is that define a role that then shows up that shows up in the child namespace or edits a role might be useful. Uh, we should probably scope that a little bit more down to the minimum of that intersection of uh, well, because like the API inheritance is is sharing discovery, right? That's one thing. Sharing roles and data is a different thing. Are we doing copy on write? Like, what's the? I would I would probably say that it's just for right now. It might just be a union of like create like like want like have like do the ba the basic which is like maybe for a workspace there's just a, a shim rbac that has the delegate to the core rbac and you ask decisions <laughs> and you can also ask the parent like if, uh, i haven't even gotten there yet so like what i'm working on is uh if you are a client and you come in and you do discovery for slash apis or a group or a group version, or you actually want to interact with a custom resource, you want to do CRUD operations on it, then uh, your URL will include a logical cluster in it, which is your workspace. And if your workspace is configured to inherit APIs from another workspace, those will show up in discovery and you'll be able to do CRUD operations on those and they will be stored in your logical cluster in whatever namespace you put them in. Right, and, and the RBAC thing I think is similar but not the same, under spec, and we wanna scope it to the minimum that shows the zero cost idea and then 
mm. allows a user to access a workspace. Like allowing a user to ac access a workspace is desirable, but we could always walk it back and say, oh, okay, well, we didn't actually want to make it easy for users to go, for an admin to go give access to a workspace. It would be desirable. So that might be just an example of maybe the roles are inherited from the parent and the role bindings are in the workspace. Like whatever the bare minimum is, and I think we should just talk about the the punch, the kicker well, um, we talked about mm. for others. But then, uh, roles inherited from the parent. So you would your bindings live in the workspace? You'd have a binding so. per workspace. Like what is that? That might be a very simple way to go about it. And yeah, I don't. I I probably say we want to slate some time to talk through the aspects of this and maybe come up with a few use cases because. Um, there are, uh, the idea, like, this is a security idea that we might, like, we've d just kind of discussed and like developed a little bit, which is the example is today in AWS, an account is a very, very hard container boundary that has a lot of useful security properties to large organizations and multi-tenant organizations, right? An account is a fief in of itself. GCB projects, Azure resource groups, they're a little bit lighter, but they still share some of those hard characteristics. Our back is important enough to spend the time on to say, um, maybe we want every workspace to have a role binding in it, or you don't have access to it unless you are some class of user, because that kind of looks a little bit more like the AWS account model. Um, alternatively, maybe we want to have something on the workspace object that says this these people have these base roles and those can never be taken away from the workspace and then there may be an option where we say look hey look the admin has access i don't know which one we need to talk through it but this gets into we should just get enough of a direction that people can access the workspaces and create the objects as andy is getting at mm. and do the rest of the demo and it's got to stay close to zero cost so we can definitely scope it down Okay, so I, I suggested give workspace access to a user without object or CD fan out as like the goal. Is that I think a so. reasonable phrasing? Okay, that that makes sense to me. And the interesting, exciting thing about object at CD fan out being avoided is that we think this means it scales to thousands and thousands and thousands of workspaces for free. One million workspaces. Yeah. Just like APIs, <laughs> inheritance, Excellent. some form of inheritance that yeah. yeah. kind of works is an organizational enabler because then organizations can be like, oh, I can centralize it. And they can they can doctor evil their way to right. complex organizational policies. But the, so uh, centralized organizational administration is one dimension of why this is interesting. The other dimension is it's free to have a million of these, yes. uh, which is differently interesting. The workspace. Probably our back, yeah. something our back is yeah. the most number of objects. As long as we have our back things copied into workspaces, we are not. Which is cost. aware. Maybe I, maybe I'm like just not thinking through this straight. But like, would it be free, right? Unless you're giving literally everyone the same roles and bindings in every workspace in your entire org, you'd have to. You can't share all of that data, right? I think, uh, well, so, but there's unique properties of RBAC, and this gets into like webhook authentication. Like the unique properties of RBAC is it is an additive model and that you can union two sources. And so it could be that you might say like, oh, like uh, we just define a virtual workspace that is like the RBAC source for an org, or maybe it comes from the org. Or yeah. maybe like, so yeah. we just, I don't know what we, we don't know what we need to do yet there. So I'd probably just be like, it, we want to get at the common elements of organization, which is mostly roles or okay. the ability to interoperate with things that you add, right? Like adding an API, as Andy has stated, has to give you access to edit that API. It's kind of pointless unless you don't. That is a point of zero costism that, you know, uh, is there a role implicit with getting an API export, like a developer and an admin role? that splits the permissions of those different types of objects. We hadn't even really started to consider that, or maybe y'all have, like, Stevan, Andy, I don't know if that's something you'd already look at. I wonder, to, uh, to make this actionable, wouldn't it be enough if some, some, somebody in the team tries to via two authorizers 
into our KCP API server. One which basically takes those roles and bindings from some organizational admin workspace. Another one from the logical cluster. And maybe even a third one to, to check whether the user has access to the workspace object. Very simple, yeah. doable now, and we can present something and use it as a demo. Yeah, and they can wire it in to the existing cube infrastructure. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Okay, I think this is clear to me. Okay, cool. We're only 23 minutes over our normal time. I hope that's okay. Uh, deploy an application. This is where we are starting to show um, scheduling actual stuff. Number two was about registering physical clusters. This one is about when I create a deployment and service and stuff. Um, uh, thank you for flagging this, Steve. We should get rid of that. Um, workspaces when there are no physical clusters. Um, can't seem to select anything. Um, but uh, most of this is there with the namespace controller that we have, or the namespace scheduler we have right now. Um, ingress is a to-do. Um, I don't know if uh, I don't know if ingress is going to be more difficult. Hakim is, is uh, tagged for the ingress. Yeah, he said his status was good. Okay. But I don't know. I don't. I don't know which parts he said were good. So we may just have to wait till he's back on Wednesday. Okay. Or the other a PR, two, like a whip PR open. Oh, nice. Uh, the other two, the two things I've highlighted here are things we need to do, things I need to do, but have not yet. Uh, I think those are fairly shovel ready. I just need to go do them. Um, and ingress. So that one's. That one's there. Extension of two, yeah. Uh, transparent multi-cluster, this is at a second location, disrupt one of the clusters, it moves to the other, ingress follows. This is also in the same way, uh, something in namespace, namespace scheduler already does the... Uh, uh, the work items here talk about shards. Oh. Which I don't think is part of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I think, I think that these points don't belong in transparent multi-cluster. They probably belong. We can move them down somewhere else. But item yeah. item six, which we deliver at some other point. We're not supposed to be adding items, Steve. I mean, uh, you can put them in a medium term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, including health checking, we we should be able to do that uh, already or soon. The shard type. I'll move. Oh no! What am I doing? Terrible. I'll fix that later. Um, and this is also not done yet, but relatively straightforward. Um, okay. Is anybody? I think we learned some things doing this, so that's good. Uh, I wish we had done it before the end of the meeting. <laughs> Maybe next time. Uh, or the three meetings we just got bumped off the end. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Uh, all right, does anybody else have anything that they saw that they want to talk about or anything else? All right, excellent. Uh, see you all on the internet. Bye, everyone. All right. See you.